The Falkland Islands are globally significant for a wide variety of seabirds. Around 72% of black-browed albatross, 43% of southern giant petrels, 30% of the world's Gen 2s and 36% of the southern rockhopper penguins call the islands their home. Falklands Conservation, with their annual monitoring programme, now have a wealth of data to draw on to analyse population trends and how the Falklands seabirds are faring and, for the first year, they're comparing longer-term data rather than just year on year. Gen 2 population, the trend over 30 years has been pretty uh, stable or, or you know, indicates a, a potentially increasing population um, and that's, that's quite a, a positive thing, although this is a highly fluctuating but, but generally positive trend. Rockhopper's breeding population um, from the figures that we have appear broadly stable, um, but we have to bear in mind um, how those figures are, are pulled together and the, the, the main site which we monitor at Steeple Jason, which has again the majority of the Falklands population, um, shows uh, slightly more steep declines in the, the broader model, so we need to think about it in that context. Uh, and obviously the breeding success for Rockies is is on a long-term decline. So um, it, at the moment, we would say, okay, it, it, it's, it's stable. There's no um, immediate signs of a, of a decline in breeding population, but it, it's something that's definitely a concern. Albatross uh, seem to be generally on a positive trend, the black-browed albatross, um, in the date uh, from the time frame we have, um, which kind of reflects other information on that species from demographic studies um, on survival rates and, and things in albatross. Um, giant petrel, we, we only we monitor about 8% of the site at Steeple, but um, their population has been generally increasing over that interval as well, although that did coincide with a, a sort of um, continued decline in breeding success. The other species um, that we look at um, uh, tend to be either individual colonies or smaller groupings or whatever, so it's, it's a little bit more, um, or we should have more caution about interpreting that, but I mean the king penguins that um, volunteers, for example, have, have been basically on a, a positive trajectory since uh, that's over 40 years before the programme started, there was information on those. Um, so they, they did, appeared to be doing as they are globally um, pretty well as a species. Um, and then, yeah, the others, uh, we, we do monitor Magellanics at Gypsy Cove. The the figures this year was in terms of the burrow occupancy, so that we, we can't do um, apparently occupied nests. Um, but um, they they have had the worst year on record at, at Gypsy Cove. Um, the indications are, at the moment are of possibly a, a fluctuating and generally stable population, but you know it, it's difficult to say with the data we have, and they, they could be on a on a slightly downward trajectory. But it's a, v a very small site in in relation to the whole population. The monitoring program, running since 1989, visits a number of sites each year and uses various methodologies to count breeding birds and chicks. What we do is go up uh, relatively close, but obviously not close enough to, to disturb the penguins, uh, and move kind of from one side to the other side of the colony with a click counter. Um, and what we're doing is we're counting all the, uh, the chicks, so we're not counting the adults, because what we want to do is look at the breeding success of the colonies. I'm here to um, do some aerial shots um, for the survey. So they've got quite a clever piece of uh, software, which means that they'll you'll go up kind of 90 degrees, um, looking down, take a still, and then they've got a piece of software which they click on each chick, they're counting the chicks, and then that tallies up. So it's quite a, an accurate way of doing it. The estimated breeding populations are counted in early summer with apparently occupied nests looked at and the number of chicks are counted close to fledging time to calculate the breeding success. Figures have been fluctuating over the years and the impacts of climate change are considered in the reasons for these. Short term and long term uh, influences on, on these populations will vary. Um, we, we see a lot of of reporting on, on short-term impacts. So we may see um, a particular season where we see a lot of, uh, say, disease outbreak, or we may see a particular um, season where uh, the birds don't seem to get food, and so we see low chick weight, or we might see starvation, or, or adults uh, abandoning the chicks um, early. So 
there's also predation and disturbance. There's a lot of things which can kind of um, ebb and flow in, in, in short time scales. Um, but I think, yes, the, the influence of the underlying influence of climate change in the long term is one that we, we still need to understand. And I think probably a lot of the, the short term impacts that we maybe see will be uh, climate change linked ultimately, um, you know, food availability and starvation or whether the, the birds are more stressed and they're more susceptible to disease. Overall, there are many different factors and pressures on seabirds and its long-term monitoring is useful to see how the populations fluctuate. While it looks positive for some species, others may be bringing up some concerns. We should be optimistic for, for some of them as it stands at the moment. Um, some of them, are, uh, mainly the rock upper, are, are showing signs, um, but I, I think you know, the, the way in which they're varying with, with climate change and the oscillations is that that is really the, the big concern is is they haven't had to respond maybe to two extreme events before now but as we go forward you know we could see a very different uh, future for these species you know that's what monitoring's for.